now we come to the media picks of the month, Mr. Brockman. And uh, the, the, the past few months have been quite a bumper time, I think, for archaeological media. We've recently talked about The Dig, the Netflix movie. Um, there have been various documentaries, which, which we've both enjoyed, in the, I think, in the past six months. Uh, and in recent weeks, I've been hearing good things about a particular TV show. Uh, 89 minutes of TV on the BBC uh, by Lucy Worsley, who c can sometimes appear to be a bit twee in her presentation. She, and it, I think, she deliberately plays with her with her image and her presentation in order to bring people along on a familiar yet surprising journey in most of her historical narratives. Uh, and in this instance, she was examining the Blitz spirit, which is something which I've I've ranted about in the past. Uh, I, I made a video um, a little while ago now, suggesting that Britain needs to um, to drop its World War II obsession. Uh, and and in that video, I was making the case that that it's not so much about forgetting, but rather remembering. Uh, and honouring the actual events of the Second World War, as opposed to mythologising them for whatever current political reason is convenient. Um, uh, in that instance, I was getting particularly fed up with people taking World War II imagery and using it in order to prop up and further the cause, for example, of Brexit. Um, but this, this, this show in a very similar vein, actually, was on the one hand, raising up the great resilience and ingenuity of real people, the will to live and to survive and to not be uh, crushed by an overwhelming experience such as Blitzkrieg. But on the other hand, didn't shy away from simple truths in terms of the management of a crisis actually during a time of crisis. This TV show has been made during a pandemic and aired during a pandemic and Simple things like, for example, examining the keep calm and carry on slogan was a wonderful way of highlighting the myth of the Second World War as much as highlighting the, 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 the true uh, and truly heart-wrenching heart experiences of people, especially in London at that time. Um, now, we can, obviously, we can get, get into it a, bit, a little bit more, but what, what, what were your impressions of... of of this documentary i well first of all let me say i really liked it mm. um i thought it was it, it's interesting it, obviously uh, it's a period i've studied a lot it's my archaeological specialism the archaeology of conflict um and so the material it was using i was familiar with mm -hmm. but to see it on a mainstream TV channel and given an hour and a half of airtime to actually breathe, mm. uh, I thought was a really interesting decision, in the, commissioning decision in the first place. Mm. And I agree with you completely that I, I, the more I've seen of her TV work in particular, the more I, I think that for all her sort of um, jolly hockey sticks, curator of historic royal palaces persona, Lucy mm. Worsley is actually really subversive mm. in that what has become her sort of TV stock in trade is to take a familiar story. And she's done it quite overtly in a previous series called um, History's Greatest Fibs. Yes. Um, it, it, it's to actually undercut the story you expect to be watching. Yeah. Mm. And what I particularly liked about this, and we can talk about the production later, I've got one or two quibbles with the production, but what was very clever with this and beautifully done was that the whole program was built around the spine of primary sources drawn from mass observation diaries and other uh, contemporary accounts um, to personalise something that was massive and traumatic, mm. and the Blitz. Mm. Um, so it took, I think, six individual stories, six individual narratives, and then use them to tell the story of the blitz, the first blitz in fact from september to uh, january 1940 into 41 yeah. and so it was a very familiar story um but it were um 
Um, and to historians, that material is quite familiar too. It's been, you know, and the idea that the Blitz wasn't this great national coming together of uh, of can-do spirit and and was actually bloody awful mm. um, isn't new for historians. But I think for a TV audience, it probably is, and all the more important for it than uh, the program. Yeah, and and uh, so so before we started filming, I I delayed us by half an hour uh, today mm. because I, I was doing my homework late and watching it after breakfast mm. or with my breakfast uh, because I'd heard such good things about it. I didn't want to just be saying, I've heard good things about this. I wanted to actually yeah. watch the thing. Um, yeah. And uh, I, I had to pause it on several occasions because it just sliced through me. There were, there were uh, yeah. I, I won't go into detail here because it, it, it was an age banded program and some of the content is, is extraordinarily graphic. But in that sense, uh, what I found interesting was that, as you say, I, I'm, I'm familiar with these contrasts. You know, I mentioned it in that, that rant video I did a few years ago about how actually blooming awful things happen to people. Um, for example, yeah. in public air raid shelters and yeah, there was looting, yeah. there was all this other stuff that happened in, yes. in the Blitz. Um, but in that sense, I've always come at it from a, given my background, from a sort of North Wales, um, slightly sort of, I guess, socialist leaning sort of family mm. background in so much as it was it, I've always thought of the Blitz as being a story of cultural change and reaction to events driven by communal action which it was yeah. and this is what was highlighted in, in, in Lucy's piece but to hear then amongst that stuff some of the stuff that, that some of the details are of what people saw how people felt uh, specific t forms of injury shall we say um and and the helplessness at the scale of what was unfolding the fact that that you you, you could have uh, uh, uh so i'm trying not to tear up at the thought of it the fact that you could have you know for example a fire just about being under control then another incendiary bomb falls on it or falls on the building next door just the the the, yeah. the crushing overwhelming nature of it was really well uh um demonstrated in this piece but mm. but i think more than that what was also really well demonstrated was the fact that actually there was there were some things I, I didn't know uh so one of them being the reticence of government to allow people to use the tubes as public oh um, yeah public refuge uh the fact that the uh that for the first six months eight months of the war um uh, people kind of got a bit of war fatigue and uh uh, it was down to you know something like a fifth of people um, uh, were, were wearing them uh, had their masks with them and it, they, they were called people who believed in the phony war yeah. uh, i've made a note here the phony war um and also as well the fact that the, that the government was handing out contracts to builders to build public air raid shelters that promptly collapsed on people and crushed their inhabitants alive or rather yeah. to, to death um it all has grim resonance with again a time of crisis being examined in a time of crisis and it, it, and, it, a and a time of crisis when the government likes to pretend it's in control but when in fact it is barely in control and in some instances of what it's trying to do is actually incompetent yeah so in this instance for example with the, with the posters there were three posters that, that, that were okayed by the uh uh, the Home Secretary. One of them was was scrapped when it became clear that the other two were being seen as deeply patronising. And the one that was scrapped yeah. happened to survive in a bookshop not too far from me, um, here right. in Northumberland. Um, and that was keep calm, carry on. And yet that's become so important, I think, for modern Britain as an idea of the Second World War and the and the Blitz. Precisely. But it itself, yeah. as Lucy says, she even uses the word, is a myth. It, it, you know, yeah. it was pulped because no one was swallowing that 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 nonsense back then. Yeah. They, they didn't want they, they yeah. didn't want that. I found that really interesting. Yeah, but I mean, again, for for for, for our times, the uh, um the the subtext of the entire uh, hour and a half was about communication, and, and mm. with a large part of that being about government communication, how governments communicate with their people, particularly and, in the kind of time and the media. And the media, and and control the media, and seek to and, and seek to guide and twist and uh, the, what the media said. I mean, what, and what, you know, um, let's talk a little bit about how the film how, how the film's constructed. It's constructed around these, these these individual narratives, which draw in and personalise the events through 
individual eyes, individual witnesses. Now, as a historian, there are dangers to doing that because obviously individuals see things in all sorts of different ways and to draw general conclusions from one or even half a dozen um, individual stories is is dangerous. But what what this was doing here was, was saying, OK, look, there's another way of looking at this period mm. and another way you need to consider looking at this period. Very interesting, for example, in terms of personalising it and drawing it in, um, almost from the get-go, from the, um, one of the first things that Lucy always talks about as a, as, as, a, uh, as a sign of things to come is what's called the Massacre of the Pets in 1939, when, just after war had broken out, when hundreds of thousands of pet animals were put down. Well, um, I, think, I think she said because, 350,000, maybe. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the figures are, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 that's, that's the kind of figure that's normally quoted, yeah. yeah. Um, bec- uh, and, and, and she, I think quite rightly, says, you know, that was a sign of the concern, the possible sense of panic, actually, that people had because the government had been building... The, the government um, figures... Uh, the out- outbreak of war was, was that the um, first air raid on London was likely to result in something like 20,000 casualties. Mm. Mm. Now, in the end, there were ru- just over 20,000 casu- fatal casualties in the entire blitz uh, on London. Yes. I remember my figures more or less correctly. So, you yeah, know, but, but uh, so in some respects, it wasn't as bad as they were expecting. Mm. But what did happen was pretty bad and the other very clever thing about the production is that you're drawn into the the the, the individual stories of you know so you've got um nina mazel i'll come back to in a minute who was a, an 18 year old jewish schoolgirl from essex uh who was a reporter for mass observation mass observation is the basis of a lot of this it was the government body that was set up just down the road from me actually in blackheath it, it had its headquarters mm. um to uh basically what we'd now call focus group yeah um people pe- people would fill in diaries about what they were really thinking as the war began and then progressed mm. um it was one of the fir- it was the first time really that that kind of um big data had been collected um you had francis Fabio, who was a an artist and um volunteer nurse um living in chelsea mm. uh, in her mid-30s uh who becomes pregnant in the course of the in the course of the Blitz, um, a, a Nigerian uh, law student uh, called Ita Ekpenyon, who, you know, and again, the contribution of black people to uh, this, what has been really a sort of a, it's the, it's the white narrative of, of, of Britain alone and East Enders and Jelly Deals and sing-alongs around the piano, around the old Joanna in the, in the shelter. Mm. And, you know, uh, so it, it, it was, bringing these different vo- very disparate voices and several others to the story well, to tell and the story. That, so and in that instance actually it was interesting because his focus was on community from the standpoint of the commonwealth and an imperial absolutely a time in the empire as, as he saw it and it was interesting how he had to remind people as a, as a warden to you know yeah. that the, 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 yes there were people who from london there were members of the commonwealth and also there were guests in his words there were people from other countries taking mm. shelter at, the, at that time and if Which you, if you was, can't was... be civil to them he said you're welcome to find shelter somewhere else i thought that Abs- was yeah it was a wonderful little it was it was beautifully understated and the point's absolutely devastating mm. Mm. it's we have to open our arms to these to the to these people and be welcoming mm. because they're fellow human beings and and and, and particular point about refugees. Mm. So that 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 was actually very moving. And I, again, um, no spoilers. But of the people that uh, you get to know and like in the course of the program, one of them doesn't make it to the end. Mm. Mm. And again, that was a that was a dramatic device, um, but very well deployed. It wasn't telegraphed. Um, and 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 actually made it actually made the point that Lucy Bursey also made in the commentary, which was that this was a time when random decisions you made, for example, putting a light in the breast pocket of your coverall, mm. might actually save your life or might result in you dying. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So it was it, it it was it was very cleverly constructed from a uh, from from a dramatic point of view and quite right. So it's, it's one of the best uses of 
um, dramatic reconstruction I've seen in a long time. Um, and in that, and what was also, in... Well, so, and in that sense, I think it, it very well underscored. And again, this is something that I had great sympathy for it for in my rant video. Um, is the fact that it traumatised people. It absolutely traumatised people, and indeed this nation. You know, across the all, most of the yeah. major cities in England, in particular, were uh, were bombed uh, at some point during yeah. the war. So, um, anyway, so go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, and, and I think the, the, the underlying um, the underlying story about communication, government communication, the use of mass observation material, um, the use of candid personal. The fact that um, Nina Mazel's story in particular was very interesting. She wrote a damning report into a, an air raid shelter in Stepney, mm. um, and so-called Tilbury shelter, um, which she then found was being misused uh, to tell the, the opposite story to the one she actually wanted to tell. But it, it was a, a, you know it was this basically incompetently run hellhole. Mm. Um, her work was being misrepresented, and she ended up um, as, uh, a, 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 as she she put it, um, that researchers were being misrepresented. And, and as she said, I left soon afterwards in a blaze of indignation and fury. Mm. Um, you know, uh, so it, it's very, uh, it, it, it's really powerful. Um, and. As I say, it, it's not new. I mean, I've got a um, book here, um, "Myth of the Myth of the Blitz," which uh, by uh, Angus Calder, which came out in 1991. So you know, th this this narrative of a different version of the Blitz has been around for at least 30 years, if not more, in historical circles. The use of mass observation diaries, mass observation archive down at Brighton. Or, for example, um, that, that milkman on the front of the cover there. Yes. Yeah. The, uh, yes. Well, that, that 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 that's the personification of "Keep Calm and Carry On." Um, it's actually the photog but, photographer's assistant, isn't it, holding milk bottles? Yeah. Something, yeah, and, and, and again, behind in soft focus is absolute chaos. Yeah. Mm. And destruction. Mm. You know, so it, it, it's it's really you know it's it's important in terms of the research. It's not groundbreaking. I think in the way in the in terms of presenting that research on television in historical documentary, um, I think it is really really powerful. I'm just sorry there are a couple of missteps in the yep, archive film and the generally. Yeah, okay, okay. Well, no. <laughs> Again, it used archive film really well, and some film is either I haven't seen very often or I hadn't seen before, which is mm. for a historical documentary is remarkable. Mm. Um, very often producers take the easy route and take the first few um, shots that come up on the on the on the, on the, on the search on Getty uh, on, on Getty or whatever or Bridge yeah. uh, on Pathé or whatever archive you're looking at. Mm. Um, they they've done their homework here. I just wish that they'd had uh, somebody just finally fact-checking it uh, because we had um, RAF Lancasters bombing the East End on September the 7th, 1940, which really wasn't good. Yeah. And um, on the table and worn in one of the reconstructions was a, uh, something called a Zuckerman helmet, which didn't come in until months after the period that they were talking about. Um, whereas the rest of it was, that, you know, it was really well-dressed. It was, it, you know, it, okay. I'm a World War II conflict archaeology and history nerd, so I spot things like that. Mm -hmm. But you know, it should something like that shouldn't go through get get through the, the well, process. The, the Lancasters in particular was a weird one. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that, are you talking about the footage that was superimposed in the sky above the guy who's over the was it the Sainsbury's warehouse or whatever? It it um, was done twice. Yes. Yeah, right. Yes. Yeah. Um, anyway, well, yeah. So, yeah, that wasn't that wasn't great. The helmet, I I can let that one slip, but you know, uh, as someone who 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 I, initially, who's a, at the very least a Viking specialist, if not a prehistorian for the most part, you know, a matter of oh, don't get is, we're, we're, we're gonna we're gonna get onto the shields in 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 Lost, in Lost Kingdom, aren't we? Lost Kingdom. <laughs> oh. But actually, um. There's some, something that I, I, so I wrote down um, one of Lucy's closing um, comments in this in this this piece, which I thought was very interesting and, as you say, very timely, and particularly on the BBC now, it was very interesting. Uh, <clears throat> so her words: When we look back at this extraordinary chapter in our history, I think it's important to try and look beyond the cliches. Yes, there was remarkable res resilience nationwide, but there was also terrible suffering. History is an inherently messy 
business. There's never just one version of events. And beyond the official version, I think we owe it to people who were there to make their reality, the reality of their experience, count. If there's one thing we can learn from the Blitz about a national crisis, it's how to value everyone. Uh, perfect. In so I many think ways. That was, that, that, I think that was really powerfully put. And I would make just one final comment in wrapping this up. And obviously we talked earlier um, about the government's apparent attempts to manipulate the national story, the national narrative uh, that we're seeing at the moment. Um, I just allude to, again, the very clever, visually very striking use of um, the University of London Senate House, uh, which is a building I know really well. It's, uh, I, I, was a, uh, I did my master's with Birkbeck and got my was awarded my degree in, in, in Senate House, uh, and the library was a, was, is a very familiar place to me. Mm. So I know that building very well, but it, it, it was used uh, because it was used by the Ministry of Information uh, during World War II. And... Uh, so not only was the setting used really very in a very striking visual way, mm. um, it's worth remembering that uh, had the Germans invaded, it was probably going to be the Gestapo headquarters, according to German German documents. Ah. Uh, uh, mm. And subsequently, um, it's been used as a film location, including for Gotham City in one of the early Batman films. Nice. So, yeah, th 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 there's a visual language, there's a very clever visual language going on there as well, if you, if you, if you want to see it. Well, um, and and actually, it, it was interesting because I think it was also uh, the setting of the, 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 that she was put into. Um, because they, were, they were marrying up so reactions to the reality suddenly of when the war actually arrived on Londoners' heads in particular. They match that footage up with people now wearing masks, and suddenly, the, when you know, when the reality hit, she said people weren't happy, and uh, that was an interesting. And she didn't have to say anything else; she just showed a little bit of what was happening now. Um, but also the fact that, uh, as you say, she sort of resisted the the um, what would have been a very easy narrative choice to be inserted into drama. You know, so in, in some of her previous programs, perhaps she's learned to ballroom dance in, a, in an Austin-esque kind of way, in a ballroom costume, in a setting that's, that's appropriate. And um, in this instance, she wasn't learning how to, how, how to manage a hose or something to put out a fire. Yeah. She was simply in timeless attire, I think, somewhat sort of 1940s-ish, but also very modern. That's exact. That's the point. Um, I was, yes, exactly, yeah. that, exactly and, that. And she was behind a desk where someone would hand her a dossier, uh, probably an assistant, a production assistant, or maybe even who knows, maybe one of her students. It's hard to, you know, we don't know. But they would hand this over, and it was just, she was playing the part of ministry above the fray, but also in that sense removed from the fray by time as a historian looking back. It was a very elegant way of of saying this yeah. happened here. But I'm not going to try and insert myself into it because that's not that's yes. not my job. And also, in that sense, yeah. we shouldn't, you shouldn't, as the audience, be inserting yourself into that narrative either. Um, yeah. you know, and and as well as she said in that in that um, in that soliloquy, uh, we have a we have a, a duty to represent those times honestly and mm -hmm. and to one of those people who who shared their stories. Um, the past is another country; they do things different there. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Incidentally, so by the way, I should say it's on iPlayer at the moment that that documentary. So um, and and, 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 and we, uh, in the the new style iPlayer, um, you actually have a year to watch it rather than a month, which was uh, as previously. Brilliant. So, so yeah, so check it um, out. If you can. Yeah. I, I, I think we should uh, we should stress um, that, as you said, it is um, age banded uh, yeah. because it does contain some, if not. Uh, um, Sometimes, uh, sometimes visually and certainly verbally graphic content, and fully justified. It's not gratuitous, no. But it's a tough. Parts of that program are a tough watch. Yeah, yeah. Well, as I, say, I had to pause more than once and just yeah. go and talk to Mrs. Soup for a moment just to get it out of my out of my head. So, for your media pick of the month, Mr. Brockman, I uh, I suppose I want to ask you uh, why do you hate people who I know and and adore? <laughs> 
you know, <laughs> poor, poor Gary Bankhead and his river river um, meanderings. Uh, you know, you, you know, you, you, uh, he's a lovely man, and now. Chloe Duckworth, the amazing Chloe Duckworth. You've just you've just got it in for anyone I know. I, I there's a there's a blacklist, uh, and clearly uh, my associates are on it. <laughs> Absolutely. Look, 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 first of all, I you know I I, I, I don't know who you, you you associate with in your in your in, in, in your off days, Mister Soup. Um, I you know I I don't have my spies out following yeah. you know, ta- ta- tailing people. Like, okay, if they ever appear on a TV program, they're on the hit list. <laughs> No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm obviously, I'm, I'm very much setting you up for a fall there. I'm terribly sorry. Um, no, no. But, but what I will say is that I haven't seen the Great British Dig as we're about to talk about it, and this, the reason for that is that I don't want to be able to agree too much with your criticisms <laughs> just yet. So, so I love and uh, and and when they say I adore professionally Chloe Duckworth, and, uh, and I'm more than happy to go away and watch the program, having heard your your reasonable critique. And make up my own mind, and I would invite other people to do the same. So, so, yeah, she's grand. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> well, look, okay, cards on the table. First of all, TV and TV criticism—it's big boys' rules, all right. Yeah, yeah. So, if you, if, you, if you put yourself up on national TV, then you're up against um, the great and the good in media, and also some of the very worst. Yeah, and also, and, this is and also, you're part of a legacy of programming. That's been going on that's, for decades now. Yeah. Uh, we will come to that in yeah. a minute because yeah. that's one of my key points here. Uh, one of the key things I'd like to explore here. And, and also, I would say one of the problems I have with this programme is not the individuals presenting, in particularly Chloe Duckworth. In fact, uh, I would say one of the problems with this is the fact that um, the, uh, the archaeologists concerned are underused. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and okay, uh, look, look. Let, let's let's cut to cut, cut to cut to the chase. Um, mm-hmm. The Great British Dig. It's a new commission um, for Channel Four from a relatively new production company called Strawberry Blondes, which is um, has, has, has done a lot of shows uh, aimed at the sort of roughly the teen market and uh, and for the BBC Three and and, and channels like that. Yeah. So it, it, this is a step up for them. Um, it, it uh, now tell me if this sounds at all familiar. A group of archaeologists are placed in an environment um, where they have a limited amount of time to go and dig in people's back gardens and try and uncover a part a story of the local community. Mm. Have you heard that one before? I have it on at least two occasions, I think. At least, yeah, exactly. That's yes. a, that's the that's the problem with the program. Yeah. Mm. Um, I, I mean, I, unkindly, you might say it's time team light. Okay. Mm. Um, it's uh, the premise is exactly that. It's um, the first program uh, in the current run uh, uh, of three w- w- was at a place, in fact, just down the road from you at Benwall in South Shields, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, excavating the vicus uh, of the the Roman fort, uh, the, the wall fort at Benwall, right. um, and. Um, the, uh, the the episode I watched actually yesterday on catch up um, was the uh, priory at Lenton in Nottingham. Okay. Um, now, so you've got a, re- a next week's program is a World War Two installation on the uh, on the northeast coast. Mm-hmm. Um, the the program it, it, and again it, it 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 is absolutely right and good that we're doing uh, shows like this from regional perspectives mm-hmm. um, and the the, the perspective. Um, uh, on the current series is in the northeast, and that's great. That's possibly because the archaeological consultancy that is credited in the program is actually based in the northeast too. Yeah. And um, but the uh, so they're working on on, on, on familiar territory, and uh, I you know I don't know what other work's been done in the in that particular area before that they might be drawing on. You might have a better idea on that than I have. Okay, so but, is there a three day time limit for the dig? That is one of the problems. Is it it's trying very hard not to be time team when in fact it's time team. Right, I see. Um but for example, um at various points the popular actor and T V presenter Hugh Dennis, who fronts the programme mm-hmm. I wonder where that. Now, who did that before? Um, uh, 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 alludes to uh, we've had a great week. 
Um, and a week would be about right in TV terms for, for recording something like that. Yeah. Um, and so there's no overt timetable. It's about telling the story. But in fact, there is a timetable. Because... Okay, so, so you have your filming schedule, you have your Tony Robinson stand-in. Yeah. Um, is there a Mick Aston equivalent? Not exactly. And again, that's one of the problems with the show. Mm -hmm. um, it's clearly being, quotes cast by the producer. Mm. Mm. Um, you have three perfectly amiable, professional um, archaeologists. Um, they talk about... Um, the, uh, lead, uh, uh, the lead field archaeologist is Richard Taylor. Um, there's another field archaeologist with a background in commercial work called Natasha Bilson. And Chloe Duckworth, who, who we've already alluded to professionally, is Dr. Chloe Duckworth of Newcastle University. Yes. Um, and an expert in glassware. And that's part of the problem. She's used as a, as a, as a, as a, 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 a instead of exploiting her expertise and the fact that she's a, a, a very senior and respected academic. She's used as a, a as a grunt digger, right? Yeah. Um, and the I think one of the biggest problems I have, um, as I say, it's trying not to be time team when in fact it is time team. And one of the things that made time team work is that it used genuine subject experts across archaeology from landscape through excavation to pottery specialisms to geophysics or whatever to come to showing how they came together to tell a narrative in a community hmm. and so, with so a in community. that sense the specialisms would sort of cross pollinate on perspective sometimes they'd have an argument exactly. about what the geophysics is exactly meant. yeah exactly mm. Exactly. And, and people would tease the geophysicists about saying, how can you be so, you know, it's just sort of splodges on a piece of paper yeah, yeah. or on, on, on a computer screen. There's none of that here. Right. Uh, partly because it's been done on the cheap. I see. It's a lot. It's a well, small it's probably crew. also been done with some, if not looming, then certain during, certainly during pandemic restrictions as well, I imagine. It has been, but then archaeology has been carrying on during the pandemic restrictions yes. mm -hmm. and um you know for example in, in the first show at Benwell, there was a walk-on part for resistivity in somebody's on somebody's lawn but what you didn't get which you got in time team was the organic explanation within the program of where the fort sat in the landscape you weren't told that half of it had been chopped away by a reservoir in victorian times right right they alluded to victorian houses yeah. Um, Victorian gardens that they were digging in, but they didn't show you where they were. So, the, and there so, was a really... so when you say a lawn, this was someone. This was a residential garden. The conceit of the program is that you know, part of the first act of the show is um, you know Richard and Chloe and Natasha walking up to people's front doors and saying, "We're archaeologists. Can we dig in your garden?" Regardless of the fact that we actually know that it's been set up by the researchers and the, and the people concerned have signed releases, mm -hmm. and the whole thing's a conceit. Yes. Right. Yeah. You know, because uh, yeah, then they're not going to take the trouble of uh, taking half an hour out to to film where somebody's going to slam the door in their face. No, but but I suppose, I suppose my point there being um, my, well, my my question there being did they for the, for this resist resistivity sort of walk on was there any as there yeah. might have been in time team for example was there any conversation about the limitations of that technique in a residential setting power cables cars sewerage manhole covers all this stuff would interfere with with that wouldn't it yeah. right okay. no and and, and 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 there was some yeah they they have for example dig HQ rather than the incident room okay. Um, which happened to be set up in a pub garden in the Lenten episode. You know? <laughs> pub dig, um, pub dig, <clears throat> pub dig. You yeah. might say that I couldn't possibly comment. Poor Blinkle, the great, might. The greatest <laughs> show ever scuppered by football, I think, anyway. Um, it's probably absolutely, not true, absolutely, actually. It's probably uh, 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 absolutely. But, you know, uh, and... and, 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 and and there are what to me were some bizarre editorial choices. So, for example, in an episode about a Roman fort and in South Shields, and if you wanted to give a flavour of where to, uh, of the, the Roman context of this in a visually interesting place, mm. where would you take your university experts to talk to Hugh Dennis? 
probably the riverside or, or to the fort for example museum at Arbea or Segedunum. Precise, precisely. Yeah, you've got, got something in virtually in. Yeah, no, exactly. No, that's the point, though. You, you, you've got somewhere, you know, Hadrian's a, Wall. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You've got a simulacrum of of, of 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 the gate at Benwall reconstructed at Arbea. Mm. You could use that as the cue to your yeah contextualizing yeah. the landscape on the this wall. This is and so what on. we're looking for. Yeah. Mm. Instead, they went to central Newcastle and Castle Keep in central Newcastle. Oh, I see. So a medieval keep. Yeah, rather. when they're talking about a Roman fort. It was okay. bizarre. A little bit, a little bit jumbled. Yeah. It's okay. a little bit jumbled. And and and, and the other thing, I mean, I, I sat watching mm -hmm. it um, with with my partner, and, uh, and we we turned to each other at the end of it, and she said, "Do you? Want, uh, do, um, I'll tell you what I think." Mm -hmm. And one of the first things she said was, "I don't know why they've employed you, Dennis, because he's t he's telephoning in a performance." Right. I see. You know, Hugh Dennis has, has uh, his TV persona is this sort of uh, amiable bewilderment, you know, as um, mm -hmm. you know, my namesake in the wonderful Outnumbered, yeah, um, and on panel shows and, and and so on. He's a very clever, very funny man, mm. but he's got no track record in storytelling or known enthusiasm, particularly for history. Mm. Whereas Tony Robinson, as well as being well known through Blackadder, was also a writer, a, a TV producer, and had and, and, and crucially had met Mick Aston before Time Team was even launched. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When, Tim, when Tim Taylor put together Time Team, he put together his cast of characters. Yeah, but most of them already knew each other. Mm. Most of them had worked together before. They knew, and 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 and, and so what 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 Tim Taylor did was sprinkle the the fairy dust. And again, we. Um, we're going to finish, I think, by talking about the late, great, and wonderful Victor Ambrose, mm. uh, who was an integral member of, of Time Team. And again, visually, the programme is really unambitious, and now that's because of the budget. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, we, we get, we've got some very average sort of excavation report grade CGI, which really doesn't cut the mustard on television, no. given what we're used to. No. Um, and what Time Team actually used to achieve on, on their budget. But that, see, one of the reasons that Time Team was axed wasn't just changing fashions in TV commissioning. It was the cost. It was an expensive show to mount. Yes. Um, and at the moment in television, the problem is budget, 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 because no, the audiences are fragmented, the adver advertising take is down, and it is very, very difficult to create something that is... Um, that is sustainable in financial terms for the TV companies. So what everybody's doing is um, trying to do uh, formats that allude to one of the few programmes that has cut through, um, which is Bake Off. Mm -hmm. So everything is the Great British. So we've got from everything, we've got the Great British, we've got the Pottery Throwdown, we've got the, you know, the, the, these reality shows that allude to Bake Off in the title. Or, interestingly uh, enough, they refer to the Second World War, Dick for Britain, this kind of thing. Well... Yeah, uh, exactly. Mm. Um, and uh, it, uh, 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 look, there's an old joke in Hollywood um, that, uh, that the only ism Hollywood believes in is plagiarism. Now, I'm not accusing I'm not accusing the producers here of plagiarism, but they are going back to a tried and tested format. And I think Time Team did it better. And the archaeologists concerned deserve better. You know, Chloe Duckworth is a very is very good on TV. Mm -hmm. But she's not. She's not given much to do. No. Um, it's to it the programme's credit that it's more inclusive from the get-go than Time Team ever was, mm -hmm. um, at least for a large part of its run. But that's just that 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 is a sign of the, the time. But thankfully, we're becoming a more inclusive profession, and we're more aware of those kind of issues. But yeah, it, it, it's so if, it we, really... if we if we if we taking all these things as as, as given then. Yeah, is there is this is there somewhere to go with this series? Do you see a, a second season as developing the formula and maybe innovating a little bit, having that's found their feet perhaps? That's a very good question, and it's certainly what happened with Time Team. If you look at the early Time Teams, they're playing with the formula, they're playing with the different 
characters. Yeah. See, what made Time Team work was that it was a cast of characters working within the format of a police procedural. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It worked as television. Mm. This is trying to make archaeological test pits where not very much comes out exciting telly. And it's very, very difficult. So, uh, yeah, put it this way. Yeah, mm. it, it, it's... Uh, in, in terms of the archaeology, technically, it looks very good. Mm -hmm. But you're getting the kind of artefacts coming up in the programme that they're getting really excited about, and it's a tiny rim of medieval pottery. Yeah. That's great. And, you, know, you can reconstruct a, 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 a job. But, but what's absent from this are the people. Mm. You know, there's no Robin Bush or, and or historical expert to talk about the primary sources, to talk about what's happened there in the past, to talk about... Yeah, you know, that there was some lo in the Bainwall episode. There was some location stuff from Vindolanda. Um, in the Lenten episode, they went to uh, the um, uh, Sherwood Forest, where the quarries for some of the building stone medieval Nottingham were. But the thing, you know, as an archaeolo archaeologist, there was some things that were really odd. So, for example, in the Lenten episode, they do some uh, geological coring. With a, um, with a quarry drop, which is great, you know, it, and then they explain the technique and uh, and and, uh, and 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 showed the showed the results, and they pulled out some uh, fragments of building stone, probable building stone, that uh, came out from a probable medieval layer or or or, or, or uh, early modern layer um, close to the river, and uh, the the stuff the, the rock concerned was from about 15 mark quarries, about 15 20 miles away. So there's a story there which they told, but what they didn't say was why is it in that fragmentary state? It's probably because it's demolition rubble. Mm. They didn't, you know, that they didn't go the obvious extra step to explain to, you know, that uh, that uh, you saw the modern houses, you saw a, a sort of reconstruction of the medieval priory, and they they argue that they found part of a previously unknown lady chapel, which is great, but you didn't get the rest of the story in terms of you know what happened to the building stone from from thing can you see it in any of the surrounding buildings still in nottingham none of that i, I would invite you once again to speculate on the future of this show <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I suppose what i'm trying to do here I'm trying to give him mm. the benefit of, of the doubt in so much as clearly there was an attempt made yeah. to make a, an archaeological mm. TV show. And that that is to be commended. There's also, as well, I think yes. it's also important that we underscore the fact that we're not just two, two blokes who go, Time Team was amazing, you see what I mean? And because and, and right. in, and, and, in that sense, I don't think that's what you've been doing, Andy. I don't think that that's what, right. that, that's what I would want to do either. Um, but it's interesting right. that, that, as you say, if you're going to do this formula, comparisons to time team are inevitable. So where where do you think this could go in? So, so for example, okay, is there a third direction? Because if you think about it, time team had its police procedural, as, as, as you describe it. Yeah. Pub dig, yeah. as, as short lived as it was, had the mm. conceit of going from pub to pub because pubs are very sort of social, historical places. Yeah. It fitted in with Roy McGrath's kind of character. Again, a funny, funny it Fitted man. in with Paul Blinkhorn's character. Well, and Paul well. Blinkhorn's character, yeah. Biker archaeologist. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. But, but and, and, with... and, and, and wonderful, wonderful he is too. Yep. But, it, um... but it fitted in with, with their characters. But also, there was an interesting moment in one of those shows that I've praised, for, oh, actually I praised in an early review, I did it on a, on a yeah. blog post, where, yeah. um, where not only do you feel invited into process, because you're at the you're at the table, as sometimes happened in sort of um, end of day discussions on time team. But in this instance, you're at the table yeah. in the pub, talking about what's been what's found or been not found. And at one point, Roman William Graf's like, "Oh, disaster! There's an empty pit. Oh, we found nothing." And Paul, very amusingly, just says, "Ah, grasshopper! Only if you consider nothing to be." Uh, a lack of a result, and and so so that that was that was a second direction. So much as that was that was much yeah. more come in you know come into the fold and learn about actually in in a very accessible way. Uh, in, I know you don't like necessarily to, to focus on this element of archaeology, but the scientific method in that sense, the fact that actually a negative result is a result. Yeah, 
this kind of thing was was folded into part of that program which i thought was very admirable and so, so I, 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 hang on hang on i need to pull you up there i am not anti i'm not anti-scientific archaeology science has a huge role to play in archaeology yeah. but the wonderful thing about archaeology is that it's not just science no, yeah yeah, it makes yeah. It better than yeah. science uh-huh, uh-huh. Right? okay okay <laughs> Um, on the table. <laughs> cool, cool. Um, but no, but in that instance, what what you had though, you didn't necessarily actually have this. You don't require the same focus on story as Time Team had to make that pub dig show. The pub dig show was often actually it was it felt often more like a scenario that they were presenting, or a, a story of a section of a town or a place or a village. So you don't have to do that. In order to have a, a good show that, that that can that can do its job well, so what what could this show, the Great British Dig, do in the next season? Hopefully, unbounded by pandemic restrictions and so on and so forth, to sort of forge its own way, maybe taking the best of what's come before and doing something a bit different. What 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 do you reckon? And again, having not seen it, I, I can only sort of prompt uh, you know that sort of qu- query. Right. Okay. Um. I, yeah. I'm, I'm not privy to the decision-making processes in the upper reaches of Channel 4. No. Um, I don't personally, and I, I, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, and I think it's not, the, and I have to emphasise, it is not the fault of the archaeologists who are involved in this. No. But I think it is a really dull format that doesn't play to the strengths of the people they've cast. Mm. Uh, it's been done cheaply. And I think that um, the, the welcome it's had from a lot of people in the archaeological community, which I can understand, because any look, seeing any live archaeology done by real archaeologists on television is something to be welcomed, OK? Yes, yeah. Um, but um, I think it, it, the, the, the fact that it's been so well received in some quarters is due to the fact that we're so unambitious about how where we uh, how we try to place what we do in the public forum yeah and so people are grateful just for any tidbits from the t- from the tv table yeah which arguably we and have been I, for uh, far too long i mean i sometimes bring in yeah. uh, at this sort of juncture i would sometimes bring in the case study for example of the staffordshire horde and the relationship between between rights to that hoard and public dissemination of information, people can go and look into that story if they want. But there's an element of and we t- we talked to, we talked being... earlier about the PAS and the and, and, and the, um, the the Hansen story, you know, that, yeah. which is another case of commercialising um, a, 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 a a piece of a piece of the past well, in a very com- particular way. Commercialising, but but more to the point, I think being great, buying into the the I think the myth that in archaeology any exposure is good exposure and that we should be grateful for what we get um and yet I, again another another anecdote i always throw in, in in these conversations is i've never gotten into a taxi and not had the taxi driver say oh archaeologist i wish i'd been an archaeologist <laughs> you know um we don't need we shouldn't have to fight so hard to get that exposure so as you say it, no. the, the the archaeologists should expect more and perhaps the better uh, from from the production. Yeah, look, look, you 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 asked you are, you asked me what um, what I would do and will it get recommissioned and so um, it may get recommissioned. They may give it another chance. They may give it a chance to grow and breathe. And but, but they'll need to give it a bigger budget and they'll need to make the format punchier mm. and less derivative mm. um, because the conceit of digging in people's gardens doesn't really stand up. Um, more than the curiosity factor in the first couple of programs. Once you've seen one test pit, you've seen most test pits. Even people in the game know that. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, what is really what is what did come out, and, I, and I'd like to finish on a positive. To, um, Please do. Uh, which you know, in, in, in no, I mean the Lenten episode. Um, where there was a delightful um, member of the local community um, of one of the houses they were they, they were digging in. Um, who is black Hmm. and was clearly delighted at what was being found in her garden and was shown in a trench on a kneeler and presumably because she'd been doing some some traveling or whatever with the archaeologists Mm -hmm. and that was wonderful to see especially when we're told how you know how white archaeology is and how white the interest in archaeology is Hmm. 
Mm. No, that was a really important visual statement. Yeah. yeah. So all credit to them for, 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 for that in showing how people are actually infused by basically finding out about where they live. Mm. Something Tony Robinson said to me in an interview years ago when I did an interview for an education program, a um, school's uh, resource pack I was working on. And one of the points Tony made was that, you know, when they were working in inner city Birmingham in a, in a largely South Asian community, they were just as interested yeah. as the, uh, you know, the white Anglo-Saxon residents of Hertfordshire or Sussex yeah, you, in you're, terms you're, of having you're, time you're, team you're in town. target National Trust members. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Well, uh, it, you know, so, so, so that was that was that, that was really positive. But as I say, I, I, I just think it has to be made punchy. It probably needs a bigger budget. And actually, in the end, I think. If you look at television now, what is probably needed is something like a project that can be looked at in depth over a number of weeks. So you watch the thing develop, you get to know the characters. Um, you know, if you're going to rip off Bake Off, do it properly. And I'm not saying archaeologists, you get eliminated. No, for the technical challenge. archaeologists every week if they're trawling substandard or something. Or they get, they get a soggy bottom to their trench. But, um, you know, yeah, absolutely. Some, yeah. Some, 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 something, something that has a, a, a narrative arc, a, a, a narrative arc that can, you can develop and attach things and people to. Mm. But that's, that takes money. Yeah. Yeah, um, just just briefly, uh, I'm reminded of um, a couple of years ago. I was working with a project in Sheffield called the Tinsley Time and Travel Project, and and once again there, there's a significant, um, I believe, Bangladeshi community that, that that were actually invited in in the post post war era to yeah. um, to help manufacture get going again, uh, Sheffield Steel in particular. Um, and uh, and it's interesting how and again we're talking you know we talked in this segment about mythologies and Second World War etc. It's interesting how uh, for some residents people who you know who who, who yeah to be blunt people who who some people would say were res were true Sheffield residents you know people from actually you know who had their great great grandparents local people exactly local people who 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 you know who owned farms nearby or who you know there's a gate post from the house that used to stand there 200 years ago um they they were definitely invested in this and sometimes they would use language occasionally and not not offensively i hasten to add but they would occasionally use language that implied that other people won't be as interested in this stuff um the people who who they consider to be more recent um uh denizens of, of the area and citizens um but but actually everyone was interested everyone was interested and and sometimes you said the bangladeshi community they were coming in and they were interested in, in what happened to bring them there and why their family had settled there for the past 60 70 years um but then also they were interested in you know in the 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 roman stuff and in the neolithic stuff and in the you know they were going oh wow so there was a bronze age canoe found in the in the river or you know what well, well, what's now basically a little stream running through tinsley but um as you say people are interested in this stuff and it's really good to show that it's not just people who wear tweed and go to national trust properties who are interested in the past that that's really important so um yeah that, that's a, a good good positive to end on there